There are, there are also some extra seats over here in the doorway and in the doorway over there if you're looking for seats. Uh, so welcome to CITP, the Center for Information Technology Policy. Welcome to our weekly luncheon series. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is Steve Schultz. I'm the Associate Director of the Center. And I wanted to remind you that in addition to uh, today's luncheon, we have a couple of other events going on. Today at 4.30 in this room, we're going to have a chat, uh, a video chat with Ronaldo Lemos, who some of you may be familiar with. He's a leading cyber scholar in Brazil, and there have been some interesting developments recently in Brazil uh, pertaining to the free and open internet, uh, including some actions by the government to take down YouTube videos uh, of uh, prominent political figures um, and progress or lack thereof on a more comprehensive internet law, which Ronaldo was instructed in writing. Uh, so he'll talk to us about some of those developments. And then next week, Wednesday at 4.30, uh, we have, uh, and we have a little poster up here, we have Matvi Sundar uh, giving a, a lecture on her new book, From Goods to a Good Life. And that will actually be on the first floor of this building in room, or no, it won't be. It'll be uh, right outside uh, uh, here on the third floor uh, in this sort of open space out here. Uh, so please uh, come to both of those events. If you're not already subscribed to our mailing list, we do a once a week events mailing list, um, and you can subscribe on our website. Uh, in any case, uh, I'm delighted to have Arvin Narayanan here today to speak to us. Uh, some of you may know that Arvin was originally scheduled speak a couple of weeks ago on this same topic, and we had a bit of a water explosion in the building. Um, so I'm happy that he can <laughs> now uh, finally uh, give, give us his talk. So Arvind is a new faculty member here at Princeton in computer science and CITP. Uh, he's done a lot of work on privacy and anonymization, uh, as well as work on things like the uh, Do Not Track proposal uh, uh, within W3C. Um, and a variety of other work. Um, he was also named, and you probably don't like people mentioning this, he was, probably, he was named as the world's most wired computer scientist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> By I wired just about forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yes, you just about forgot about um, Yeah, so I'm sure that's uh, on a plaque on your wall. It was a nice article, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> right, if anything, you should be more unwired than yeah. anybody. Um, in any case, uh, welcome, Arvin, uh, and uh, I'll let you take it over. Thanks, Steve. So I guess the uh, crypto dream survived for two extra weeks because of the water accident, but now we can finally say goodbye to it. Um, so this is a talk that it's, it's interesting for me to be giving because a lot of the uh, key events in the history of modern crypto in the 70s that I'll talk about, I wasn't even born when those happened. And so it's, it's a bit weird for me to be giving this talk. And um, I mean, it would be great if, if someone uh, who's, who's been through those events could, would share their perspective. But I haven't heard too much of a discussion about the events or about the issues that I want to bring up today. Um, and so I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, this is this is more of an opinion than uh, than a lecture type thing. So let's. Uh, I I would love to hear what you all have to uh, say about this. Okay. So let me start by asking you, who's has anyone read this book, Crypto, by Stephen Levy? A couple of you. So I mentioned this book for two reasons. One is that for me it was a great uh, starting point for my historical investigation uh, to into understanding the beginnings of modern crypto. But the other reason is that I find the subtitle very interesting, How the Code Rebels Beat the Government Saving Privacy in the Digital Age. Now, the first part of that subtitle, How the Code Rebels Beat the Government, absolutely true. It's the story of how uh, you know, crypto used to be classified as munitions by the US government and this rather silly policy of export controls, and how crypto advocates, including uh, people at the EFF and a bunch of others, managed to uh, convince people that this was not a viable policy and freed up crypto into the public domain. And, and that, was a, that was a successful movement. So that's the story of that. But the second part of it is a little weird, saving privacy in the digital age. You know, it doesn't quite seem like that was the consequence of that. And especially because, because this book was written in 2001. And if you think about privacy in the sense of uh, 
uh, resisting surveillance by government entities and uh, and corporations, that's probably around the time when things started going a little bit more. So so that's kind of funny, right? So and and that. Um, meshes very well with the overall message of my talk, which is why I wanted to start with this book. So I was mentioning to a friend a couple weeks ago that I was going to give this talk, and I was giving him uh, the, the motivation for this talk that I just told you, and he said, duh, people just want to play Angry Birds, right? <laughs> and I found that comment funny, but I also thought to myself, I'm really glad I'm giving this talk because I reject that explanation. I don't think uh, the reason crypto hasn't been adopted as much as people thought it would was because there is no demand for privacy-enhancing technologies. I think that's an oversimplified and incorrect and a bit of a cynical explanation. There are other oversimplified explanations out there, uh, like crypto being computationally expensive. So those are not, I think, what the actual reasons are, uh, which are, I think, much more subtle and interesting. So let's see what some of those might be. Now let's, let's take a historical perspective. Let's start at the beginning. In fact, let's go back about 200 years to this quote by Edgar Allan Poe that says, Human ingenuity cannot concoct a cipher, not a spelling mistake, by the way, um, a long time ago, which human ingenuity <laughs> cannot resolve. So this was the reigning paradigm for over 2,000 years. Uh, uh, people thought that it was always going to be sort of this arms race between two adversaries, one uh, creating codes and the other breaking them, and the one that was more scaled and had more resources was going to win. And this was the story of Enigma in, the, in, in World War II, for example. So that's what people thought, and things somehow changed rather abruptly in the 70s due to at least three mathematical and algorithmic inventions. Uh, that's the data encryption standard, right, for symmetric encryption when two parties share a key. Uh, the diffie hellman key exchange for two parties to actually get started sharing those keys when they don't already have shared keys. Uh, and RSA for public key encryption. <coughs> now, what, 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 what these things changed is that this was the first time <coughs> that an average user could hope to have encryption technology uh, to encrypt a message that would have a prayer of resisting attack by the most powerful adversaries over a sustained period of time. And the other development that made this possible was that the microcomputer revolution was in full swing, and so the average person had access to computing technologies. Um, so this was probably not a major paradigm shift from other symmetric ciphers before it, although it was much, much stronger and resisted attack for a long time. Uh, but uh, asymmetric cryptography was definitely something completely new and uh, changed the game entirely. So when we look at the culture of crypto research during this period, one word stood out for me more than any other, and that's politics. So the motivations behind most of the crypto pioneers' work during this period were inherently political. Which is interesting because uh, in modern times, crypto research, at least as a direct motivation, is more about solving interesting math puzzles than about the social goals that the technology is intended to achieve. And, and that, I think, is an important factor. Let me show you a few quotes to illustrate that. This is, again, from the Stephen Levy book. So Whit Diffie says he really believes in the radical viewpoint and explicitly makes the connection between politics and the work that one does. So let me clarify. There's going to be a few more of these quotes. I don't mean this in any sort of disparaging way. In fact, I admire this a lot. And I find it uh, you know, somewhat unfortunate that modern crypto research has lost this connection. So here, here, here's a few more. Marty Hellman, again, deep-seated suspicion of a centralized system. So this connection between cryptography and decentralization is something uh, that's going to come up again a little bit. Phil Zimmerman, in, ma in matter of PGP, was apparently a freedom net who was uh, twice arrested in rallies. OK, um, enough with the quotes. Uh, so another point, historical point that I wanted to mention was that the narrative around crypto during this time was situated in the context of the broader narrative around computing, which was undergoing a sea change. And here are some examples of that. These two books are from the early 60s, uh, titled The Naked Society and the Privacy Invaders. So the point of view that these books had was that, uh, so this is about computing in general. So the point of view that these books had was that computers were tools of the state. And in particular, they had a specific view of the state, a, a giant bureaucratic, almost socialist state that was interested in using computers for sorting and cataloging and numbering its citizens, uh, or that was the narrative anyway. 
Uh, and it kind of made sense because at, at back in, in, in the 60s, governments were the only entities who are probably very large corporations uh, that owned and used computers. And so this changed over the next few decades. By the 90s, as I understand it, it had completely changed. In this latter book, I intended not as, uh, as an exemplar of the new viewpoint, but a, as a narrative of that viewpoint. It's titled From Counterculture to Cyberculture. And the point that this, book's makes, uh, this book makes is that this change in narrative was not something that kind of automatically happened due to the change in technology, but was in, instead deliberately orchestrated by a small and uh, well-connected group of individuals, people like uh, Kevin Kelly um, of Wired, I think, Nicholas Negroponte, uh, Stuart Grand, and people like that. So, you know, uh, computing, freedom, autonomy, privacy, crypto, these are all some of the words to keep in mind in the sense of uh, understanding the culture of the security. So this idea of uh, crypto as a tool for liberation and freedom was kind of taken to its logical extreme by the cypherpunk movement, of which Eric Hughes and Tim May were two of the early important people. Here are a couple of quotes from them. This is like this is for in a different category than the ones I showed you before. Uh, even allegedly benign governments are a constant threat to the well-being of citizens. Tim May says transactions beyond taxation, and to nation states, etc. Here's a report that I love a lot. Uh, we create, using crypto that is, we create virtual regions and the conduits and pipes of the future, the very mortar and walls of these virtual spaces could be held up by nothing but crypto. Oh my god, it's so profound, there is nothing else. So at this point, Stephen Levy, author of the crypto book, um, mentions that Tim May talks about crypto like he's been asset tripping, which <laughs> is an interesting comment, but I actually think there is a specific mathematical and computational meaning behind what Tim May is saying here. Again, I can't know exactly if he meant that, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a couple of slides uh, what he probably meant. So I've been talking about you know the crypto vision and the crypto dream, but in order to make that more concrete, let's start by uh, distinguishing at least three different uses of crypto, which are often uh, confused in my opinion. They kind of fall on the spectrum, but they're also distinct. So one is the sort of mundane use of crypto for ensuring the security and integrity of e-commerce transactions, right? SSL, we all use it. Uh, everybody needs it. Everybody likes it. No controversy. It's all good. The latter two are different. They're more about privacy than security. So this one, uh, resisting surveillance and new privacy intrusions, this is kind of what I call a weak crypto. This is about a good analogy, in my opinion, is PGP. Uh, so PGP used for email encryption, that is. If you think about the US post office, uh, we can send mail to each other with, uh, with the peace of mind that the post office is not reading our mail. Uh, but people started to realize that with electronic mail, we didn't have a guarantee anymore. So the idea was, let's use crypto to at least go back to the same level of privacy that we had in the physical world uh, and not, and not uh, go into a worse situation where there's a lot more surveillance. Does that make sense? That's, that's a very common use of crypto. So this last one is a different category. This is, this is what I call the strong crypto hypothesis. It's about using crypto to have a new and kind of unheralded era of privacy that we could not even imagine in the physical world uh, using things like um, uh, you know, key exchange, which, again, there's no real physical world counterpart of two people who have never talked to each other being able to establish a shared secret key. So let's, uh, l let's look at the strong crypto hypothesis in more detail. And to me, there's one sentence uh, more than any that I've read that's a great example of this. This, this is, uh, again, from the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. There were two of these manifestos written during this period, the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto and the Cypherpunk Manifesto. So this one says, just as the technology of printing altered and reduced the power of medieval guilds and the social power structure, so too will crypto fundamentally alter the nature of corporations and gov uh, corporation and government interference in e economic transactions. Right. So that was the magnitude of that vision to bring about fundamental social change, to upset existing power structures, change the balance of power, etc. So that was the strong crypto vision. The mathematical underpinnings of this go back in large part to the work of one person. Now, there were a lot of others later, but in the beginning, it was uh, David Chom, who, as I understand it, did a lot of this work uh, by himself in the early 80s before other people started paying much attention to him. And there's one paper in particular that I like a lot called Security Without Identification, Card Computers to Make Big Brother Obsolete. This was written in the mid-80s. 
it combines both, uh, it's both an exposition of the math behind a lot of his crypto ideas, as well as uh, he's talking about the social implications of it. Now, David Chong was the inventor of the electronic cash protocols. And electronic cash just by itself, you can see how that could have important social and political consequences. For example, um, decrease the need for physical currencies, and, and as a consequence of that, weaken the power of governments, et cetera, et cetera. But there's more to it. There's a whole another layer to the crypto uh, that Chom imagines. Now, you might wonder if we're replacing a lot of things like cash using crypto, and you know we're not tracking people's identities and financial transactions, what about cheaters? Um, how will, how will uh, uh, various commercial entities track people's reputations? What about credentials and so on? Now, Chom has answers to all of these questions. He hadn't necessarily fully worked out the math for all of these, but it was clear that he was thinking about them. He was thinking about things like uh, pseudonymous credentials. He, uh, and he was also thinking about things like how to revoke the anonymity of a player in the system only if they did something that was <coughs> against the rules, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it wasn't entirely clear at the time how to do that, but even things like pseudonymous reputation, where people don't have to give you your identi their identity, but using crypto, uh, they, can, uh, uh, they can keep and maintain a reputation. Um, so whether it was Chong or the people who took after his work, they were thinking about all, all of these things. And so let's think about that for a second. What these guys were talking about is sort of breaking down um, ideas like trust and reputation and credentials and sort of rebuilding them from the ground up using crypto. Rebuilding only those parts which the cypherpunk pioneers thought fit into their vision of what this new society was going to look like. So this was no longer just security using crypto or privacy using crypto. This was governance using crypto and technology. This was social order through technology. And that was the magnitude of the strong crypto vision. I mean, they, they were going to tear down those walls, which go, goes back to that quote that I talked about a few slides earlier, and, re, and those walls would now be held up using nothing but crypto. So that's what they were talking about. Um, and again, uh, you know, I wasn't there. This is the best that I've pieced together by reading uh, the writings of and from that period. Uh, but I think this is a fairly good approximation. One can ask, how widely was this vision believed? That's a little bit difficult to pinpoint. My best guess is via an analogy to what's going on right now. Many of you may have seen the decentralization movement. People who are uh, very upset, for example, with uh, Facebook and Google being centralized repositories of our personal data. So there are things like decentralized and distributed social networks. There are things like personal data walls. There are a whole bunch of these movements going on. It's not necessarily the case that the average person believes in it or has even heard of it, but it's taken very seriously by you know, a very significant minority of the technology community. And most people in the technology community has, have at least heard of it. So that's kind of my mental picture of what strong crypto was in the late 80s and early 90s. So, I mean, uh, poking holes in the strong crypto vision is not is not that interesting. Uh, I'll say a few things about it, but hopefully, it, you know, it will be re relatively clear uh, why we're not in the strong crypto world. But I'll spend uh, the majority of this talk talking about weak crypto. But so, well, what I think, in a sentence, was wrong with the strong crypto hypothesis was that the key phrase that everything was about is breaking down these power structures and upsetting the power balance. Now, it's clear that the cypherpunks believed in that, and they thought all nation states were a threat to freedom. But the average person really doesn't. Um, we've voluntarily vested a certain amount of power uh, with governments, and you know that's compatible with democracy. And I think most people are OK with that. And that's a big part of the reason why there wasn't nearly as much demand for strong crypto technologies as, as these pioneers thought. And here's another interesting difference between weak and strong crypto. If you look at PGP, you and I could decide that we want our emails encrypted. And we could both start using PGP, and we would immediately gain the benefits. If you talk about these things, if you're talking about a pseudonymous reputation system, the only way that that's meaningful is if there's, you know, if there's a broad support for it. That's not something that two people can get started on. Right? So this really depended on a change in, in, the, so, in, the, in the overall uh, social vision for it to be meaningfully adopted. And again, I think that was another way in which uh, the crypto pioneers, or the strong crypto proponents, overestimated the demand for these technologies. 
<laughs> okay, so let's talk about weak crypto now. So what I mean by this is, again, using PGP as an exemplar, domain-specific privacy improvements. Uh, these are more modest. It could be you know, about encryption. It could be about location privacy. It could be about your genetic privacy. It could be about uh, the toll that's collected on the road when you drive through a toll booth. Why does that toll booth have to know the identity of your car by reading your license plate? Why can't we have crypto going on between uh, the RFID device in your car and the toll booth so that your car can make the payment without revealing your identity. So these are all domain-specific goals that, uh, that weak crypto has. Now, interestingly, just like a lot of math behind strong crypto goes back to Chom's work, a lot of the math behind weak crypto goes back to what I call Andy Yaw's magic trick, better known as uh, uh, secure two-party computation achieved via Ethereum known as a garble trick <laughs> there. Who's heard of this? A bunch of people. OK, great. Um, so, so let me explain what this is. Uh, what Andy Yao proved was that, uh, let's start with the example of a millionaire's problem. The millionaire's problem goes like this. There are two millionaires. They meet for dinner. They decide that the richer of them is going to pay for dinner. However, they don't want to reveal their net worth to each other. So they want to perform some computation based on their two inputs, their two net worth values, so that they will both identify which of them is richer. But other than this one single bit of information, neither will learn anything about the other person's wealth. Right. That's the millionaire's problem. And if you encounter it for the first time intu intuitively, you might think, oh, that must not be possible. You have to tell them something, at least how many zeros are in that number, or what the first digit is, etc. But it turns out, again, using crypto, that it is possible that you reveal just that one bit and nothing else. And in fact, the amazing thing is that the way that that would work is that you represent the computation of uh, uh, compar comparison between two numbers as a circuit, and then you do a general computation on top of that circuit. Now, there is no way in which that computation is specific to what this functionality is, the fact that you're comparing two numbers. So this Yahoo's garble circuit protocol works for any circuit. And the amazing thing is that any computation can be represented as a circuit, whether you're trying to check if uh, two people's location matches or something to do with DNA or something to do with the toll booth example that I gave you, any computation at all between two players um, can be expressed as this kind of circuit. And we have this extremely powerful theorem, uh, again, going back to the mid-'80s, showing that any such computation can be performed in such a way that the two parties know the agreed-upon result of what that computation needs to be, but none of the inputs and none of the intermediate results, except to the extent that it's automatically revealed by the other. Does that make sense? OK. So, the weird thing about that is that this protocol works by encrypting every single gate, every single AND and OR and NOT gate of that circuit. Um, I, I use encryption loosely. You do some kind of operation over that, and these are kind of expensive operations. And so there is a, there's an entire cottage industry of crypto papers that look at specific domains and specific computations and try to do much more computationally efficient versions of what Yao's protocol assures us is possible in a general sense. Now, I knew that there was there were a lot of these papers, but then I recently put in privacy preserving into Google Scholar and found that it brings up 700,000 results. So it's it's just a huge body. It's not necessarily all the same papers, but, there, but there's a lot. Um, and I'm going to be a, a bit blunt here at this point and make a, perhaps a controversial statement, but that I uh, really believe in, that there are a lot of perverse incentives operating in this space, not particularly in this space, but in general in academic publication. But the way that it manifests in this space, one of the ways is that there is uh, an incentive for creating more clever and complex solutions. If it turns out that you model some problem and there is a very simple piece of crypto that will solve it, you can't publish that paper. So you tweak the problem setting and pretend that that was the original problem until you come up with a crypto protocol that is so complex that it will take 10 pages to describe and prove. Uh, and that's how you get a paper published. I've seen this happen many, many times. And uh, well, I'll explain in a little bit why I'm talking about this. Not just crypto. Not just crypto. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> So the question I want to answer in the rest of this talk is, if you talk about PGP, for example, the question you'd ask is, why is it that the average person hasn't downloaded PGP? But the question that you'd ask about this kind of paper is, why haven't the Googles and Facebooks of the world and the power companies, et cetera, adopted these technologies? Because that's usually uh, who it's, it's targeted at. And 
Now, I don't want to criticize other people's work, so let me take an example from my own work. Uh, this was with people at uh, Stanford. It was published a couple of years ago, Cloud Location Privacy. Now, I think this is a good paper. You know, I, I think there were good ideas in this paper. I will defend this paper. But it was the usual story. We published this paper, and then we went and uh, had meetings with people at both Google and Facebook. Um, no interest. And then we had informal conversations with other people, all same story. And that's the question that I want to answer. What is fundamentally missing here? So let me start by describing what we tried to achieve in this paper. It's the following scenario. It's about location privacy. What we want to achieve is uh, you'll have a phone app. And so if you're walking around in a mall and uh, one of your friends is also in that mall, then your two phones will serendipitously uh, pop up this notification saying that you're nearby each other. But here's the crucial thing. I noticed the analogy with Yahoo's protocol. If you're not close to each other, neither of you will get any information about where you are. Nor will any party like uh, Google or whoever the service provider might be. Right? So the only one bit of information that's ever revealed by the system is that your friend is nearby within a pre-specified radius of maybe <coughs> nearby. Does it make sense? And you can do this using crypto. Uh, again, it's kind of if you can think of it as a specialization of the OS protocol to this particular uh, computational goal. Okay, so I want to go through a bunch of reasons here. Uh, let me start with. Uh, what I call comprehension, which is a broad umbrella for various things. And, and the first one is comprehension by users. And now, a part of that is usability, but I mean much more than that. Uh, let's start with the usability first. There was, in 1999, there was this great study called uh, Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. It was a usability analysis of PGP. And it concluded that basically nobody could successfully download and understand the model behind uh, and use PGP to encrypt a message and sign in and verify that encryption and signature, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been many years. Uh, people will claim that those usability problems have been fixed, but I'm not sure they have been. And also, none of it has removed the need for people to understand that understand the model and understand what is going on in the system, and that requires a lot of user education. So that's already a fundamental roadblock there. Right? Um, but I mean more than usability. Here's another example of what I mean. Let's say that, let's think about that location and privacy protocol again. Let's say Google built that, and let's say Google made that app available in their app store, or whatever it's called these days. Think about how that marketing copy would read. They'd have to go and tell people, hey, look, you can know when your friends are nearby, but nobody's getting this information. It's, it's all encrypted. right? So your location is never sent out. Ironically, that wouldn't pass people's bullshit filter. Because intuitively, that doesn't seem like something that's even possible. Right? People don't have an intuitive understanding that crypto even exists. So a lot of these conversations you can't even begin to have with users because it, it doesn't make any sense to them. So how are you going to convince them to adopt it? So that's that's one facet of the comprehension problem. But I'm just using that to illustrate that there is a huge gap here uh, between what people will accept and uh, the way that crypto actually works. And this is not a problem that you can solve by making the user interface prettier, uh, or you know, it's not a problem that Moore's Law is going to take care of, unlike some of the computational difficulties with crypto. So I want to focus on what I think are some of the uh, more fundamental barriers here. And so the next one, I'm using management for lack of a better term, but this is an interesting one. What I mean is that the existence of crypto is not reflected in the organizational structure of companies. Let's parse that. So a few times um, with uh, my colleague Jonathan Mayer at Sanford with other people, I've been in the position of going and talking to companies about adopting some of these technologies, and many times we find ourselves talking to legal and compliance people instead of technology people. Why is that? Because that's the way that all companies are set up to think about privacy organizationally. That it's a PR problem, it's a compliance problem that you want to make go away. Right? Privacy by design, this idea of integrating privacy into, into the design and implementation phase of technology, has been talked about for more than a decade now, I think. But it's somehow not made its way into how companies organize themselves. The, way, the mental model that they have is you let your engineers build their <coughs> products in peace, they'll give you a finished product, and then you sprinkle some magic pixie dust on top of it so that your privacy problems will go away, and then you make the product available. Now, crypto is fundamentally not compatible with that way of building software. Right? Because if you want to do these things cryptographically, if you want to have these privacy guarantees, you just have to re-architect your whole system. You can't collect the same types of data. You have to go to different kinds of algorithms. 
And companies are not in a position to do this. They're, they're still in a very compliance-oriented world when it comes to privacy. So that's part of the problem. And this is, uh, I think, also exacerbated by, oh, yeah, uh, this was the paper I was referring to, Johnny Cannon Crypt Usability Evaluation of PGP. Anyway, but returning to the point about regulators, um, regulation is not helping with the situation. Uh, and let me explain why. Let's uh, look at an example where regulation has actually been successful for the adoption of crypto, and uh, that would be data breach notification laws. Many of you have probably heard about this, right? Uh, various states, starting with California, passed this where, for example, if, you, if you're a company, you lose a laptop containing sensitive consumer data, a variety of compliance requirements kick in, you have to notify them, but if you've encrypted that data, you're okay. And so because of the safe harbor, uh, a lot of companies started automatically encrypting this information. So that's crypto for security. Um, regulators know how to incentivize that. I'm not going to claim that that works perfectly, uh, but, it, but it does work to an extent. The same thing is not happening for crypto for privacy. Why is that? Let's think about this. So, um, so we, uh, with others at Stanford and NYU, I worked on a project for uh, using cryptography to protect yourself in the online behavioral advertising space. And then uh, the response that we got from regulators was, oh, thank you for building this. We did not know that this was possible. Now, that's an interesting statement. I mean, we, we were happy with that response, and they appreciated what we had done. But think about the analogy for security. It would be as if you had to build a proof of concept to show that encrypting financial data was possible. And then they'd be like, oh. And then they'd uh, you know, pass uh, a regulation that was intended to incentivize financial encryption. And then you have to go and do that separately for health information. Right? And then they would respond to that. So that's kind of the analogous world that we live in for privacy. This idea that, that crypto exists and it makes possible all kinds of computations in a, in a privacy-preserving manner, um, that general insight has not, has not reached the policy world yet. Uh, and I don't know if they're even structurally capable of receiving that insight, not at an individual level, from the, but from the point of view of uh, how you regulate things. Does this make sense? Sorry. The devil's it, seems like there's, it seems like there's innumerable things in society today that maybe we should be outraged about, but uh -huh. we're not. Okay. And so do you think there's unique aspects to crypto and its adoption? Or is it just one of many things that we should feel the government should do differently in terms of policy, in terms of regulations? Right. Like well, uh, it is true that there are many things that <laughs> we should be outraged about. But what I think is different is that the reason that that's not happening is different in every case. And I think many of these reasons that I'm pointing out are very, very specific to crypto. And they all, um, you know, there are things that we can do about it. So after each of these drawback slides, I have um, a slide with possible suggestions. I don't think it's going to completely fix the problem. But I think it can help us devote our energies in a more productive way. Because there are, there are still a lot of people who want crypto to happen. And I think for those people, it might be more useful to understand what some of the fundamental barriers are and how to maybe do things differently. Oh, Mike. Um, you mentioned that the reason talking to management is, is not effective is because privacy is lumped in with uh, yeah. legal and compliance. Uh, and you were saying perhaps that's irrational. But I mean, you could, you could argue that it's actually a very rational, it's a very rational decision because you know they view, for better or worse, that um, Privacy is not in their interests. That they have incentives not to collect information, and therefore they are putting in compliance because they are using it to make this problem go away. Um, and you know the engineers are very aware of this. They're just deciding that they, you know, they can make more money if they collect all this information. I, you know, I think that's entirely possible. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that corporations are doing something that's not in their interests here. This is a message that's intended to proponents of crypto. And, uh, and my message is, if you want crypto to be adopted, where should you start fighting for that change? It's not by building more technology. It's by attacking some of these problems. I'm not saying they are even attackable, but to the extent that anything can change, I think this is where some of that change needs to start. Yeah, so follow up on that. I don't know if you're done with the drawback, but I wanted to. There's, there's a bunch of problems. There's a bunch of them, then I would say. All right. So. Um, so a small suggestion here for something that I think could change is just informing people that crypto <laughs> exists. And I think everyone who takes any sort of um, intro to CS class, for example, it's not about understanding the math behind crypto, but just developing an intuition for what is possible and what is not. 
And I think that would be hugely beneficial because a lot of these people are going to go on to be in positions like being an executive or being in government, and this kind of understanding would be uh, w would <coughs> enable them to make much more enlightened decisions. They might still decide, like Mike said, that it's rational not to use it, but at least it won't be for lack of understanding the, the existence of the solution. All right, here's another one. Um, I think the implementation complexity of crypto protocols is kind of out of control, and a lot of crypto people don't realize this. So as an example of that, let's talk about the humble hash function. This is even simpler than encryption. Almost any imaginable crypto protocol needs to have this. But here's the thing. Um, the most simple kind of hash function construction that you can imagine, it's called the merkle danberg construction. And it suffers from what is called the length extension vulnerability. Do you guys know what this is? So what happens here is that if you have the hash of a valid message, you'll be able to compute the hash of any message that's a concatenation of that message, even if you don't know uh, the key for that hash function. And this means that uh, if, you, if you use this for signatures in kind of a naive way, your signatures are going to be insecure. And this has affected uh, actual products by actual companies. A couple of years ago, somebody went in and did sort of a survey of various web products and uh, to see if they were susceptible to this vulnerability. And here was a partial list. I ran out of space here. Right? And, and this is sort of, you know, the simplest crypto primitive. And so how are we ever going to expect um, your average programmer to read a 10-page crypto paper with an insanely complex protocol and implement it in a bug-free manner? There is something fundamentally missing here. And if you look at uh, cases where crypto is successful, uh, that's because the crypto has been packaged into a library like SSL, and there are crypto experts writing that, and everyone else can sort of make use of that in a black box way. Right? But this paradigm is kind of not available when you're talking about crypto for privacy, because the whole thing is about looking at the specifics of the computation and redoing that computation on top of crypto, so you can't modularize it in a way that makes sense for software development. You can't modularize it in a way that the average programmer doesn't need to know about it. So again, that's that's something inherent here that probably needs to change in order to make this um, more viable. Mike looks extremely skeptical. Well, I mean, there's been like Fairplay as an example of a compiler that you could write regular code and it will automatically generate. I'm gonna get to that. So what what are what are some things we can do about this? I mean, I've been talking about something called lightweight crypto. Like, how far can we get by avoiding big integer arithmetic? And the suggestion, the reason I make that suggestion is actually not for the computational reasons but because I believe that it can uh, greatly simplify the implementation complexity. I don't know if that's actually true, because it, it remains to be seen if people will adopt that, but, but I think it's something possible. I've seen something interesting called Practice-Driven Crypto Theory by uh, Tom Rosenfeld and his students at Wisconsin. And this is the thing that Mike was getting to. There are tools for generic secure multi-party computation, for generically implementing the YAS protocol. The thinking in the crypto community has been, that's too inefficient, let's not even go there, let's take that as an existence proof, but let's do all actual crypto protocols by re-implementing them. Um, people are first starting to question that accepted wisdom. There was something, I think, by Jonathan Katz and others that I saw recently that, uh, that says, let's actually compare the computational efficiency of doing this in a blunt, generic manner versus specific protocols, and it challenges the view that the generic protocols are any less computationally efficient than the specialized ones. Um, so those are all some possible ways, uh, I think, in which this implementation complexity issue can be mitigated. All right, so the next one, this is, uh, I'll just say uh, something brief about this because I'm sure you all already have a good intuitive understanding of this. Crypto for privacy, uh, you know, comes with a specific view of privacy as secrecy or as confidentiality, and that breaks down a lot of cases. And one good example of that is this notion of breaking the glass in medical informatics systems. Who's familiar with this? Okay, so breaking the glass is the principle that any health informatics system, whatever the authorization mechanism uh, or security mechanism that it has, that it has, it should always come with a way to overwrite that. And you know, when you overwrite it, of course, the actions will be locked by the system, and it will trigger a manual audit later, et cetera. But there should always be this overwrite, because if somebody you know, forgets the password or something like that happens, you can't lock a person in an emergency situation out of their health information. Think about the crypto way of doing things. 
again, by default, crypto protocols don't fit very well uh, with these kind of extra needs that actual systems have. And so the suggestion that I have here is to kind of relax the adversarial model and understand that trust actually exists in the world and things like auditing and accountability and provenance and all those other things exist. You don't have to do everything in the paranoid model. This is not a comment about designing crypto systems. You, of course, when you're coming up with the RSA encryption scheme, you have to be in the adversarial model and think about the most powerful attacks that an adversary can run in order to factor a large product of primes. However, when you're talking about system design, Right? You, I don't think you should be in this model. Uh, there should be crypto in the system. But the overall trust model should be something more relaxed uh, than what it is in a, in a lot of the current crypto literature. All right. So under poor economic, yeah. Oh, the other thing that I said, the crypto trust model actually too weak in some sense, because it assumes that you can trust the machine that you're running the crypto on. That's a good point. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Jonathan Zitran made this point, this very point recently. In, uh, in, a, in a talk at the crypto conference, he titled it The End of Crypto. End of Crypto was a pun. He was talking about the endpoints that people use. His point was that people are not in control <laughs> of their endpoints anymore, of the client hardware. It's almost like we rent machines and we license software and we don't own these things. And so you're not in control uh, of, of the things that crypto requires you to be in control of. Um, yes, that, that's another great point. Um, and I think that should also play into this in some sense. So the broader thing is change the adversarial model rather than relax the adversarial model, if that makes more sense. Okay. All right. Under poor economics, I have a bunch of things. One is path dependence. So what do I mean by this? Um, desks came into existence in the early 70s. That was apparently around the same time when the ATM machine was being introduced. And the first practical use was by uh, Lloyd's of London Bank, and uh, they decided that it was too insecure to have plain text communications between the terminal and and the central system, and so they actually licensed uh, DES, or in fact a predecessor of DES called Lucifer from IBM. So this was great. So this idea of securing electronic communications in transit using crypto has kind of been there from the beginning, and that, that's just the way we do things, right? We don't even imagine another way of doing things. We would consider it horribly insecure. Think about another example, credit cards. When credit cards started becoming uh, much more widespread, digital signature <laughs> technology simply didn't uh, fit on a chip, so that was not, just not, not really an option. So instead, we went into this model of what would seem to an alien to be this whole bizarre system of you know this betting for merchants and hoops that they have to jump through in order to um, uh, be able to accept credit cards and a whole lot of compliance requirements for them, and still something that still leaves uh, the customer horribly insecure because you're just giving up your credentials to every merchant that you transact with, and, and you're just trusting that they won't abuse that, right? So we have this super weird system in retrospect now that we can easily do authentication on a credit card. That's obviously the way we should be doing things. And it would probably save everyone a lot of money. Credit card transaction costs are huge, right? I think it's about 25 cents per transaction. But we can't change that because of this issue of path dependence. There are two stable equilibria. And you can't go from one to the other without a tremendous amount of disruption of the whole business structure. Um, Visa and everyone else has kind of evolved around this model. It would be, it, it's, it's they can't even think about changing to another model, so they will resist another way of doing things, even if ultimately it might save everyone money. Does it make sense? So that's kind of what I mean by path dependence. Um, my colleague Jonathan Mayer pointed out another type of path dependence, which is think about how, uh, think about the life cycle of a company. It starts out as two guys in a garage, and uh, you know what you're trying to do is get your product to market as fast as possible. Security is the last thing you're thinking about and nor do you have the expertise to do that. And so you build an insecure system, and then you build other non-crypto defenses around that system in a haphazard manner, as and when the need arises, and you never go back to re-architecting your system uh, in, a, in a crypto-centric way. So that's another kind of path dependence. Uh, this is a much more easy to understand point, value of data, especially with the whole big data movement. Uh, companies have 
have the collection of data as a primary or secondary goal in addition to whatever functionality that you want to provide. So if you go and tell them, oh, you have to do everything with encryption so that you can provide the functionality, but you don't collect the data, they're just not going to like that. So at this point, it's much more subtle, and it actually applies to crypto for security as well as crypto for privacy. Here's the thing. Um, consider the simple task of running a web server and then you know, throwing Apache on it to be able to serve some static files, and then you just want to forget about it. We're not in a position to do that today. Because every once in a while, a zero-day vulnerability is discovered. And so even the dumbest system that needs some security requires human maintenance. And you know, there is a whole market for zero-day vulnerabilities. So ultimately, even though the crypto is foolproof, we're actually back in Edgar Allan Poe's world, where it's a question of who has more money to buy security exploits, or who is more up to date with security patches, et cetera, et cetera. So while the hope with crypto was that you could build a system where you could entirely rely on the technology for security, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And I, I, I mean, it's not necessarily a fundamental barrier. People have been working on provably secure systems for the longest time. But it's just that, for whatever reason, that's just not the way we do things in practice today. And, uh, and by the way, we have a talk about the market for zero-day vulnerabilities by Excellent. Chris Segoyan on November 15th. <laughs> All right. So just a little preview. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I, I'm just about to finish up here. So, so the point that I wanted to make is that in a world where all security is economics anyway, that's how companies are going to think about these things. That greatly decreases uh, the appeal of crypto because it can't achieve that goal of simply trusting uh, the security or sometimes privacy of the system to technology instead of considering it as a, as a human and economics and organizational problem. So what can we do about that? Um, and this is, this is a, like a half suggestion. It's not going to go nearly all the way towards solving those problems. Um, one of the things, though, that we could try to understand is that centralization simply isn't going away. And move crypto away from this decentralized model where people control their own hardware and software, the point that you brought up, and sort of instead try, try to co-opt centralization, uh, which would bring in uh, or which would address a lot of these economic criticisms, like companies not being able to collect data. Uh, so I've talked about a bunch of uh, hybrid architectures where the company does get to collect some data, but also provide some functionalities in a, in a cryptographically secure manner. OK, <laughs> here's kind of the last thing I want to say. This overarching suggestion that goes through all of this is that, in general, I think we should embrace regulation as a way of promoting crypto instead of seeing crypto as an alternative to government interference and as a way of wresting control away from those big players. And in, this, in addition to regulation, co-opt these social and legal uh, approaches um, which, which will, I think would make a crypto much more appealing to, uh, to businesses. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, there's back there. Could you say something about certification, independent certification organizations as a way uh, to deal with the problems that, that even some technologically sophisticated consumers have in conceptualizing cryptography and security. In other words, uh, sometimes you see uh, cert certifications from this or that organization. And do you think there's any possibility short of a formal regula of, of, of regulation or in connection with it, whereby something like underwriters labs or, or some other trusted, uh, like uh, in, in Germany, there's this tube that you know that is that has all these standards for various industries and and right. um, is just there? Yeah, but so, they probably have something like yeah. That so I, I I certainly think certification has a role, but it's tremendously susceptible to capture. Uh, it's susceptible to capture by the very industry segment that it's supposed to protect consumers against. Uh, there have been instances where the certification procedure you know, successfully gets whittled down into just a dumb list of, uh, of procedures that don't mean anything anymore. There have been studies around this. There was one paper that showed that websites 
that have a trusty seal are twice as likely to be malicious as those that have no one to do. This was a few years ago. But you can imagine how this might have happened, because malicious websites have a much greater incentive to try to subvert that process and somehow get a trusty seal, uh, because it makes them look much more credible. Uh, there have been similar, and I would say even more serious problems when it comes to certification for privacy. So those are some of the problems there. Uh, something analogous to certification that has worked really well is platform providers acting as police for security and privacy problems. This has been a huge reason for the success of the Apple Store, uh, probably even the primary reason. Instead of letting you download programs uh, you know, from anywhere on the internet, it goes through uh, Apple, which also acts as a policeman. Of course, there are a lot of problems with this. Uh, people have complained about you know, the free speech implications of this, the implications for competition and innovation and so on. But I, I do think it's done a huge deal for security. That's sort of another certification mechanism, uh, which I think has worked out much better. Yeah? It was fascinating, and we have chatted a little bit. I want to add a couple of things to your existing model, both Please. suggested alternative structure. One of the things that I, I'm uh, there's two things I want to differentiate, which is the regular price interests of us here and sort of people's crypto needs and authoritarian government. There are issues in both situations, like where you need really strong, no brain to glass kind of system. And I've seen a lot of efforts by crypto activists, if you would, trying to help the people who you would think would be as motivated as, you know, so that we're motivated yeah. is no problem. Yeah. And I've watched this, like, you know, there'd be a workshop. And a lot of times, the crypto activists come from your cypherpunk mm -hmm. culture. And their ethical debates are about whether you can eat honey and still be a vegan or not. I mean, it's totally too much like the Middle East or something. <laughs> what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, and they would, because they came from that culture, it was this all or nothing. They really focused on any kind of vulnerability for that one. Like, you know, they were going to have this super, super no holes kind of system. So mm -hmm. by the time, you presented a no holes kind of system, it's mm -hmm. impossible to use. It, right. just, there's just no way. Because right. if you're closing every potential form of attack, and if you suggest that, well, look, you know, tell these people that Gmail may well be good enough for you. They would. They were really culturally mm -hmm. not coming from that, which is something you're outlining here. Their culture is all about, you know, this, you call it pyramid at some point. Uh, and they may be right. But that's what it sounds like. By the end of it, you, the, the, a lot of people came from that and said, there's nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. Because it, it seemed like, unless you have 100% security, it just wasn't good enough for these people. And if it's not good enough at 100% security, you might as well right. give up. Right. And I will explain to them, even if you make it a little harder mm -hmm. for a government to find you, it's a good. So that, that culture difference, I think, they, where these people are coming from, and what a lot of regular people want in, um, say, the authoritarian government model, that's a big issue. Now, the second part, in terms of privacy enhancing technologies, I, I want to suggest a, I'm not really disputing, I'm suggesting something that I think you're underplaying, a different kind of way of structuring the question, which is a collective action problem. Okay. In that, uh, a lot of us have privacy interests that if presented in a reasonable manner, we would choose. But at any given point, I don't really have a strong incentive to encrypt any particular step of my online footprint, right? Unless I'm doing something really weird, I most of the time, or I'm doing something. And I'm really not going to be, yeah, I don't like you know big data, I don't like profiles, all of that. But it's really not an individual concern for me, except if the risk is low. Something might happen, but the risk is low. The problem, though, is the aggregation of this kind of data is indeed a power shift. Like, if this kind of data is aggregated at a centralized place, government, Facebook, Google, that really does represent a power shift. So I'm suggesting that the crypto dream had a point that if you had David Trump's kind of world in which you had you know, all conveniences of doing stuff online, but you weren't really traceable on this. You did something wrong. So, so something. you're saying that if people had a single choice, do you want to live in this world or that world, a lot more of them might choose they that They would, yeah. but there, 
it's kind of going back to the local optimum thing. But yeah. There's a yeah. point in which that the risk is at the aggregate level. Sure. But the interest of the big companies and governments is at the other end. I, so I'm saying that, uh, somebody was saying uh, this earlier, that it really is, it's not that their vision was completely false. They had a point that mm -hmm. put under my power structures. Mm -hmm. And the powerful players have no incentive to build privacy by design in a way that would actually undermine power structures. And individual users have no, you know, they would have to overcome a major collective action problem and be convinced that unless everybody encrypted everything all the time, it's not that there's a risk, there's a lot of times it's kind of paranoid talk, you know, if you don't encrypt everything, something, nothing's going to happen, and you know that. You know, it's a very low risk. You see, the collective action problem is at the individual level, there's not much incentive. And who's going to organize collectively and overcome the collective action problem? There's no way of really doing that. There's no way to make the case. And the crypto people, and a lot of them are my friends, uh, <laughs> don't really, they communicate this really paranoid sounding world in which if you don't encrypt one thing, yeah, then you do. Then sure. that just doesn't work. Either, Thank you. you see? Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. One more quick question, and then Please. I think we're out of time. Okay. Not from me. Oh, okay. Anyway. <laughs> there. So, um, just a quick, simple one, I guess. So, you keep talking about privacy. Does privacy equate to anonymity to you, or are they different things? Anonymity is certainly one way of uh, of achieving privacy in uh, many scenarios. Uh, you can have crypto with or without anonymity. So I see it as a little bit of an orthogonal issue. All right, well, thanks so much, Arvind. I want to remind everyone, 4.30 today, uh, chat with Ronaldo Lemos in this room. And then next week, uh, Wednesday, uh, Madhavi is going to talk about intellectual property and global justice uh, at uh, 4.30 out in our open space. But thanks again, Arvind. Thank you.